Good morning. Happy uh, spring. Today's the first day of spring. Wow. Doesn't mean it won't snow again, right? <laughs> We've seen this before, have we not? Like, I've seen snow sometimes in, like, May. But who cares? God is the God of everything. It doesn't matter what the weather is or what's happening in the world. He's still God. And um, this morning I was really praying. I was saying, Lord, if your presence doesn't go before us the way Moses prayed, what's the point? And so we are Pentecostal charismatic. We believe in the presence of God. Not, not his ominous presence, because we know he's everywhere, but his manifest presence, that he shows up to you. He shows up to us. And so we want to keep praying that God would reveal himself to us. You know, a lot of uh, New Age cults, uh, there's been a, a lot of documentaries out there about different cults, and a lot of them are based on uh, self-interest, you know, enlightenment. You've got to find the enlightenment. And the way they find the enlightenment is usually through a perverted way, through sex or through some kind of weird way. And, but in God, it's always based on him revealing himself to you, which is totally different. He shows up, and you say, yes, Lord, what, what do you want me to do? And that's, that, that's one of the main differences. And another main difference is God is love, right? Uh, uh, a lot of those cults are not based on love. They're based on something else. But I want to talk to you today. We're going to start a series on the uh, Beatitudes. And believe it or not, th- this may, don't laugh at me, please, but uh, um, I did all my reading in October for this series, <laughs> because I, I tend to get ahead, you know, because you never know what's going to happen. So I like doing my reading early and because it, it gives me a long time to think about it and to pray about it and say, Lord, how do you want to frame this series? How do you want to... Uh, uh, and I, I read eight books on the subject, and there are many more books, but I, I got eight, like, cherry-picked books that, that I thought were really good. And, so you know, a couple of them I really totally did, did not agree with the whole approach, but that's part of healthy reading when you're a teacher of the Bible, that uh, healthy reading is reading people you don't agree with, and it's, it's like, it's okay, all right? Um, but today I want to talk in specific to introduce the whole series on the culture of Jesus' kingdom. How many of you know that Jesus' kingdom has a way of doing things? Because culture is really how we do things. You ever notice that if you start a new job, uh, usually you have to learn their culture. What is their culture? How they do things. That maybe your, your old job, they did it this way, but this job, they do it that way. And so when, when Jesus came, he gave us this thing called the Beatitudes, which is inside of the Sermon on the Mount. He, he went on top of this big mountain, and I had Linda read this morning, to deliver this long sermon. And within that sermon is, is the Beatitudes. And did you know that a recent Gallup poll showed that only one-third of adult Americans are familiar enough with the Sermon on the Mount to identify Jesus as the source of that sermon. And many Americans who were, who were interviewed think that the sermon was a message preached by Billy Graham. Seriously. This is what I mean by, by we are Bible illiterate in America. I mean, anybody can quote you know, certain scriptures, but... Do we know the Bible, and does the word have us? Does the word try us so that we obey it? So the Sermon on the Mount, where the Beatitudes are found, has often been sliced and diced and stripped down from its original meaning through history and purpose. It has been refitted to accommodate things like personal vision statements and keys to personal success and ethics to live by or political ideals and superficial Christianity. And... Anybody can take any portion of scripture and just kind of massage it to make it mean what you want. But what does it really mean? How do we know if what we're reading isn't, isn't, isn't just someone else's opinion that is weird and really off? And this is why it's important that we know the word, that we study the word in context. And uh, when I say context, I mean in its setting. What, 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 why was Jesus saying it? What was he saying there? So what are the Beatitudes this morning? What are they? First, I like to start with this, what the Beatitudes are not. I, I, like, I like studying the negative part of something so that you'll know what it's not, so that then you'll know what it is. But they are definitely not good morals uh, where you simply apply to your life. I've heard that through the years. People say, well, if I just live the Beatitudes, then I'll, 
I'll have God's approval, I'll be a happy person. Um, you can combine them with any religion or ideas and, and kind of, you know, be an enlightened person and say, the Beatitudes are great. And most, most people who are into religions would, would agree, Jesus was great, the Beatitudes are great, plus this. And that's the problem. And, but they also are not keys to success. Um, Emmett Fox, one of the books I did not like, was kind of a motivational kind of speaker, writer. And, and his book was world famous on, on the Sermon on the Mount. And he saw them as nothing more than principles for success. He said, if you want to be successful, live the Sermon on the Mount, and you can start any business, you can have any enterprise, and you'll make a lot of money. And he said this, the Bible is really a textbook of metaphysics. Metaphysics is kind of like a fancy word for, for spiritual, you know, spiritual things. That's all it is, it's just a textbook. So the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, are not this. But also, they are not the answer to social justice. Social justice is the idea that if I do all these things, if I just feed the poor and do all these things politically and help, then I'll be a Christian. And that does not make anyone a Christian. And we find that the social justice gospel has focused on the part that says, blessed are the poor. And the fine, they've defined the gospel only as, as good acts of social justice to help the poor. And I can't tell you how many people I've met over 30 years who are great on the streets, but man, their lives are so lost. They don't know God. Do you follow what I'm saying? So doing social acts are not going to save me either. But the Beatitudes are also not this, a practical guide for the good life. And Leo Tolstoy wrote a book called War and Peace, which is, they say, the most longest book, that it's like, it's like the longest, most boring book ever. And he also wrote uh, Anna Karina and uh, other books, but he was a great writer. And one of his characters in one of his books had reread the Gospel of Matthew, simple and clear, and he saw these practical commandments in Matthew, which are the Beatitudes, that if obeyed, would establish a new order of human society. So this was people, uh, uh, someone writing from the point of view of communism. If we could just isolate those words of Christ and live them properly, we'll have a perfect world. But what's wrong with this picture? It's the danger of finding the principle without the person. If you try to live the principle without the person, you'll always fail every time. This is why cults come and go, right? They start out with incredible high energy, but Christianity has always remained since, since the dawn of time, since Jesus started it. Why? Because it is birthed by the Spirit of God. And His Word is forever settled in heaven. So when you have the principle without the person, the problem is that there's, it's, there's no spiritual life in it. There's no power to change you in it. You, you can't expect to live Christ's code without Christ living in you. That's the point. If you try to apply all those things without Christ, th there's no point. Then you're just another nice person. And by the way, sometimes people who who don't know Christ can be nicer than people who do know Christ. I'm sorry to say that. But it is never an excuse why you shouldn't serve God, right? How many, how many of you have heard, well, I don't go to church because there's so many hypocrites? How many have heard that? All right, there's not the hypocrites up in there, up in that church, right? Don't you think that that's where they belong? The hypocrites and the liars and the cheaters and, and, and the... Sinners, that's where they belong because God is dealing with them. He's cleaning them up. It's his job, not yours or mine. And I can't base my commitment on someone else's lack of commitment. So what are the Beatitudes this morning? The Beatitudes are a manifesto. Okay, what's a manifesto? A manifesto is a written statement declaring publicly the intentions, motives, or views of its issuer. Right? You have the Communist Manifesto. And, and uh, you had books like Mein Kampf that I read in college, written by Hitler at 22 years old. And these were books that talked about their intentions of how they're going to conquer the world. And Jesus has his own manifesto. When he came on the scene, he says, this will be my culture. And Jesus taught that his followers are to be so different from the world that, though, that through their distinctiveness, not their similarity, 
they would attract the world. One of the wrong things a lot of churches try to do is they try to be so the same as the world and say, we've got to attract them, so let's do everything the world does and we'll attract them. But no, Jesus said, no, it's by being different, by being distinct like me, you'll draw the world. That's how you're going to do it. Jesus' manifesto declares a profound reversal of things. You've heard me talk about that through the months, about the great reversal that is coming, where God, when you read, you read in Isaiah, where, where God makes the crooked places straight, and he, he levels the mountains, he makes the high places low, and the low places high. And in some senses, that happened this past year, in a lot of situations, things that were high were brought low, and things that were low were brought high in the, this past year. But Frederick Buchner said, the Beatitudes are lists of human lasts, who at the touch of heaven become divine firsts. The last become first in his kingdom. And that's why I never envy people in the world who have all this stuff and have all the success and have all these things. Why? Because Jesus said they had their reward. That's as good as it's ever going to get for them. So the poor in spirit own the kingdom, and those who mourn shall be comforted, and the meek are the ones who inherit the earth. It's the very opposite. The very last ones are the ones who win in the end. But also Jesus' manifesto demands a revolutionary way of thinking. And that word is called repentance in the Bible. Now when we think of repentance, I still can't shed my old strict Pentecostal upbringing when I think of repentance, that it only means going to the altar and falling on your face and repenting over your sins. But I have to force myself to see the whole picture of, of what the, uh, the Greek word metanoia really means. Repentance means a complete change of mind or opinion. Ha have you ever stood in a situation just standing there and you repented on the spot? It doesn't mean that you got on your knees, but you said, I'm changing my mind on this thing. I'm going to see it a different way now. That's repentance. And when you read the Sermon on the Mount, when you read the Beatitudes, you realize that it requires you to repent in how you think. You have to think the opposite almost of what your nature is telling you to, to think like. But also, Jesus' manifesto redefines righteousness. Think about the world Jesus came into when he began preaching the gospel, he came into a world where there were 10 commandments. That's how the, the Jews lived. And on top of that, the Pharisees through the years had added 610 laws to those commandments, making it virtually impossible to obey God. You couldn't do anything without sinning. And that's why later on in Acts, Peter says, our forefathers put yokes on us that we could not bear. He meant, he meant the law of Moses, that it was so convoluted, so complicated, that people couldn't even obey it anymore. But Jesus came with a new way of obeying based on relationship over rules. That's the difference. That if you know him, you'll follow the rules without even knowing it, without even thinking about him. Does that make sense to you? When you love someone, you do things without having to think about it. Where, where there's no love, you have to think about it. And that's law-driven. So righteousness would come from another place, not from obeying the law, but from being in Christ. That's where it comes from. And I grew up with, you know, the strict kind of Pentecostalism that had some of those, those, those features of Man, you, you got to obey God first before he accepts you. No. God loves you as you are. And he says, come to me. It's my job to clean you up. Relate to me. Be with me. Be my friend. And I'll be your father. And the Beatitudes are, are parallel to the Ten Commandments and to Moses. Did you know that? Moses went to a high mountain to receive the law of God. Jesus went to a high mountain to deliver the new, the new culture that he was creating in the world. And there are many other similarities I don't have time to get into. But in Deuteronomy 18.15, Moses said this, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. He was talking about Christ there. The coming of Jesus. So the Beatitudes are a thing of the heart. That's the main difference between Christianity and so many other religions. It's internal. It's something that happens inside you 
and what happens inside you reflects the, the outside. And there are eight Beatitudes. Some people say nine, but I, I, I combine the last two about persecution and, and being, you know, criticized and all that. So there's eight Beatitudes, and we read them, but let me just go down the pea patch real quick with you. The first one is the poor in spirit, which we'll talk about next week. But the, the poor in spirit, their, their, main, their main blessing is that they possess heaven. And Robert A. Gillich said, the poor in spirit are those who stand without hypocrisy before God, stripped of all self-sufficiency, self-security, and self-righteousness. What makes them poor in spirit are not they're, they're just down and they hate themselves. That's not poor in spirit. Poor in spirit says, I have nothing I can offer God but my surrender. That's poverty of spirit. Lord, I can't give you anything. I, even my obedience won't bless you. The only thing that will bless you is, is just giving you my heart and my surrender. That's all I can give you. That's poor in spirit. And the culture of Jesus' kingdom teaches us that the norm of his kingdom is not self-reliance, but spiritual bankruptcy. There's a lot of talk about prosperity uh, in, in certain sects of, uh, of churches where it's, there's an obsession with prospering. And I believe God wants to prosper us. There's no question about it. But the root of it all, the root of receiving all that is to know that I bring no- nothing to the table but my heart, my empty poor, pathetic heart. That's all I can bring to God. Those who mourn will be comforted. That's a promise. So if you're mourning today, and, and when it speaks of mourning, it's not talking about uh, mourning the loss of a loved one there. It, it doesn't mean that. And we'll get into that uh, in a couple of weeks, but uh, what is mourned is the loss of the things that you are surrendering to God. It's the things you're repenting about. It's, it's the life that you're saying bye-bye to that you loved that maybe sometimes you look back and say, maybe I should go back there. No, no, you've repented, so you're mourning the loss. There is a a mourning that happens after you repent. Did you know that? That you mourn because you're ashamed of those things that you did. You mourn the pride and the sins and the self-centeredness and the anger and the gossip or whatever you did. You mourn those things. And God says you'll be comforted. It's the mourning that comes meaning the weeping that comes, the mourning, with how vulnerable and naked you feel before God without these things that you were once addicted to. Now, Isaiah saw Messiah this way as one who helps the mourning. Isaiah 61.3, it says that Messiah would exist to provide for those who mourn in Zion to give them a garland of, instead of ashes. A garland is like a, a crown made of flowers, beautiful flowers. A garland instead of ashes, and the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. This is a promise to the morning. But then there's the meek. I think of all of them, the meek is, is the one that I seek in my own life the most, that I feel like God wants me to grow in the most. But the meek inherit the earth. Meek here does not mean weakness, but it means self-possession. That's the key. It doesn't mean wimpy, but it means that I choose to control myself when I have the power to react, and I don't. That's true meekness. So true strength becomes, goes to the person who restrains themselves, not the person who acts like the macho you know, person, macho man or wonder woman or whatever you want to call it. I don't care what you call it. But the person who, who, who feels like they have to exert power to hurt others and respond to them in kind. But it's not weakness, but it's a self-possession that comes from seeing ourselves the way God sees us. There's a humility that happens when you see yourself the way God sees you. I don't mean low self-esteem. I mean seeing yourself as, you know what? I'm not all that. Yes, I have a gift with this, or I'm good at that, and I got a compliment, but, you know, I want to see that in a balanced way. And we find that with such a view, we become gentle. We become humble. 
we've, we become considerate, courteous to those who act in the opposite spirit. Why? Because you don't have to fix them. You're free not to fix them. You're free not to control them. You're free not to have to straighten them out. Are you hearing me? That's hard for, for us who, are, who have strong personalities, who are doers, who feel like, you know, I don't, I don't like the way that guy's talking over there. I'm going to you know, go confront him or whatever. That, that's hard for people like us. But nevertheless, the Lord calls us to show meekness. And we'll get into that in this series also. So we find that there's a reversal here happening. Do you notice that in society, the, the aggressive and the domineering are the ones who win? You have to go out and crush the competition. You have to go out and, and just tear it up up there and, and just get it done, right? But we find that it's the timid and the meek who win the earth. That the, the kingdom perk goes to the self-possessed, not, not to the person who tried to possess the whole world. And even though right now people like Jeff Bezos and, you know, uh, the Twitter, the, the guy who started Twitter, the Facebook leaders, all these people, technically they own the earth in a sense. But they have their reward because it's all going to go to the meek, the person who chose to restrain. That's the promise of God. This is what I mean by a great reversal in the way we think and repenting, repenting in how we see the world. Because so often the world dictates to us how we have to live. And there's so much talk, even politically, about, well, you got to get your power back. You know, they took away your power. And it's all about this gaining power politically. Guess what? God is the one who has the power, and he's the one who gives the meek the power. He's the one who does it. Then the hungry, those hungering for righteousness will be filled. This one is a very important one because... The idea that, that the whole kingdom it really is built on your craving for God. It only works when you want it, when you're hungry for God. And we find that, that these people have a craving for what is right. If they love justice, it's because God loves justice. They love the broken, God loves the broken. And doing the right thing, they love doing the right thing. They love holiness, but most of all, they have a craving for God. And all those good things flow out of that hunger for God. When, you, when you're hungry for God, everything else comes natural. All the other appetites just flow out of there. That's why if you try to do this externally by obeying external laws, you become a very good Pharisee, but you have no idea of how the kingdom of Jesus really runs. His kingdom runs on love. Love is the most important thing, right? Faith, hope, and love. Love is the fuel of the kingdom. Hunger is what leads us to say, I will surrender anything, go anywhere, do anything God tells me to do. That's what hunger does. Then we have the, the fifth one, the merciful will receive mercy. The Greek word for mercy there, and, and we'll get into this when we talk about it, but the Greek word there is ilios, which it always deals with what we see of pain. Not, not, not just the pain itself, but how we're looking at that pain, someone else's pain, their misery, their distress. Do we respond in mercy or do we make judgments? I, I've seen through the years, you know, Christians look at someone who's like maybe walking on the street. Well, he just needs to get a job. Are we missing the point of the kingdom? Do you know that person's story? Have you ever met a homeless person who had a great job Maybe they even had authority in their job and, and, and just was doing, and they lost their job and boom, they have nothing. So how do you look at people's pain? Instead of criticizing and judging people, we respond in mercy. This is the culture of Jesus. We respond in mercy. Trusting that he's the judge in the end. If, if they're working a system, he's going to judge it. He'll deal with it. So their dealings are not based on exact justice, but on God's mercy. Because if we dealt with ourselves with exact justice, we'd be dead. All of us. Everyone in this room would be dead if we deserved what we got. But thank God, he loves us. That's why whoever is forgiven much, loves much. That's the key to mercy. Know how much you were forgiven. When someone's not merciful, they've forgotten how much God has forgiven them of their sins. 
Number six, the pure heart will see God. The pure heart will see God. Pure in heart as opposed to pure on the outside. Pure inside versus pure outside. Internal versus external. And we're talking about not the one who obeys outward rules, like the prodigal son's brother. Um, there's, there's really a, story, a whole story about not the prodigal son, but about the prodigal son's brother. He is the one in the end who was really lost, right? Because when, when his brother came back after sowing his wild oats and wasting all the family's inheritance, he's like, I've been so faithful, and that bum gets all the blessings. He just comes back like nothing ever happened. Wow. Don't we all have that in us sometimes where we can judge somebody because maybe you're very diligent and faithful, and you never fail, but when you see someone else fail... It bothers you because you're like, well, I'm faithful. But we find that the pure in heart are pure in the heart, not just by complying and doing all the rules and then taking pride in that, but from inside they're pure. And we find that internal purity does not come from, external, from externally obeying laws, but it's the other way around. Externally obeying laws comes from being pure inside of your heart. Social justice people can bypass the most important purity of all, purity of the heart. And I've witnessed that through the years. I've seen people who are phenomenal on the streets, but man, the way they live their lifestyle, lost, lost. They put Christians ashamed with how they help the poor, but when it comes to personal righteousness, there's nothing there. And you have to have both. Number seven, the peacemakers will be called the children of God. When we say peacemakers, we don't mean peacekeepers, like, like Martin Luther once said. Peacekeepers are people who compromise, they'll compromise all their principles just to keep the peace. No, that's a peacekeeper. We mean peacemakers. They see that violence, control, force, retaliation will never change the world. Peacemakers are not passive, but neither are they combative. And they're not given to offenses. They won't allow themselves to be controlled by someone else's violence to them, by someone else's anger. I grew up in the ghetto, you know that, and it was very normal in, in, in the street that if someone, you know, gets in your face, you get in their face, right? And we used to call it when I was a kid, you know, getting up in your grill, you know, we used to call it that. That was, that was what we called it. And how many, how many of you know that, that God can take you out of the city, but, but then he has to take the city out of you? You know, that, that city mindset. And I even saw that sometimes my wife would say, honey, you know, stop acting like Robert De Niro for a second and just talk to me as a person, you know. <laughs> um, but it wasn't funny then when she said it. <laughs> But think about this. Jesus is called the Prince of what? Prince of Peace. Because his very presence imparts peace to a situation. When you show up, do you bring peace with you or do you bring something else? And far too many Christians and churches have, have brought the opposite. They brought dissension instead of peace. And they brought division instead of unity. But because we belong to the Prince of Peace, we are peacemakers. And Colossians 1.20 puts it beautifully. It says, God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things. Notice he doesn't just say humans, but everything. The whole world is being reconciled to him. Every, every, every part of creation, all the creatures, every blade of grass is being, is being redone, right? In the new creation. And he says, whether in, on earth or in heaven, by making peace through, his, through the blood of the cross, of his cross. There's something of the cross that brings peace to everything, which means that usually if I'm going to bring peace to a situation, I have to die to myself. I have to crucify what I want because often I can be self-willed and I can, I can have like 10 arguments of why I want this or this should happen this way, but a real peacemaker says, okay, let's, let, let's work through this the way God wants it. 
And the last one is the persecuted have great reward in heaven. We don't really know what persecution is in this country, not yet. But it's coming. You can be sure of that. And persecution, I believe it has to come because it's going to separate the shallow surface Christians from those who really are following Jesus. And we've had it really easy in our country. But I've been to countries where they didn't have it so easy, where you had to hide and you had to, you had to kind of work the system to not get caught to preach the gospel. But every follower of Christ will face persecution at one time or another. And every time, why is that though? Why, why, why does Satan just want to persecute you? Think about this. Every time he sees you, he sees the creator in you. He sees God's image. So he hates God. Just like if, if a woman was abused by a man and, and, and she has her child, every time she sees a child, she sees the father she hated. A Christian is persecuted because they're attached to Jesus. And Jesus said, hey, a servant isn't better than their master. If their master gets persecuted, what do you think you're going to go through? When I say persecution, I don't mean persecution for because we're Americans and I'm being persecuted for my freedoms. No, no, no. Persecuted for Christ. Big difference. And what we'll be facing and have already faced criticism, mockery, rejection, a canceling culture. If I don't like you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to troll you on Facebook. You know, get a million people to troll you on Facebook and shut you down. It's going to happen, and it already has happened. And then torture. I want to say this as a closing note before we pray because I just wanted to introduce this series to you. But the Beatitudes are not a requirement but a proof of spiritual life. It's important you realize that because too many people have taught it in their books like, well, if you do these things, you have a great life. No, it's not a requirement. It's a test to see if you really are a follower of him. Martin Lloyd-Jones, famous preacher, famous writer, he said, we are not told in the Sermon on the Mount, live like this and you will become a Christian. Rather, we are told because you are a Christian, live like this. That's the difference. Because you're a believer, this is how things are done in the culture. Because you, you signed on to follow Jesus, this is how things are done. So what happens when you buy into the culture of Jesus? When I say buy in, I mean... When you agree to follow Christ, when you say, Lord, Lord, I want to follow you. I want to become your son, your daughter. I, I, I want to be saved. I want to follow you. I want to be part of your world. What happens when you sign on to that? One word, and I'm going to close with this word, flourishing. You've heard me use that word through the years, flourishing. It's a powerful word. And there are two words help to describe the word flourishing. One is this, happiness which is the, word, the Greek word makairos. And that's where we get the word blessed are they, right? Blessed are they. Or the better word, or happy are they, right? Happy means you're in, a, you're in alignment. When, when, when you're happy, things are in their place. You're aligned. And you feel like, wow, I feel good. Things are kind of in their place. It's, it's a completion. It's a flourishing. And makairos means Happy, blissful, fortunate. And it, 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 it occurs 13 times in Matthew and 43 times in the New Testament. I think God's trying to tell us something. And we need to pay attention. And then we find another word that helps to combine flourishing. So the first word is, is happiness or makairos, and the second word is wholeness or telios. Wholeness. Did you know that wholeness must become, must come before holiness? And the reason why many of us have gotten stuck legalistically with, with doing the law and doing things by the rules is because we don't have a vision for what it means to be whole and flourishing in God. But we still struggle with, I, I got to obey these rules to be a Christian. No, no. He says, let me make you whole. If, 
If, you, if I make you whole, you will be holy. Think about spelling holy with a W. It implies wholeness. And it means righteousness, godliness, as wholeness. Have you ever looked at you're doing the right thing, not just as obeying the law, but as wholeness? That it's, it's, it's a healthy thing. I don't know much about diet health, but I know this much, that many of our diets in our country, I believe, and I know that Lori's sister would agree with me, and Lori, you'd agree with me on this, that, that it's based on becoming skinny, but not necessarily healthy. So I got to go on a diet. And we can do the same spiritual. We could say, well, I just have to obey these rules and say, let me, let me obey these Ten Commandments, and then I'll be holy. No, no, no. That has nothing to do with holiness. Because real physical health is about wholeness about saying, I'm going to take care of my temple that God gave me to steward because it belongs to him. So I'm not going to cram all this garbage in there even though I love that pork. Oh man, it's so good. And the rice and beans, right? All that. But I'm going to try to take care of this temple. That's wholeness. That's wholeness kind of thinking. Not, not just rules. And that's what makes up Flourishing. And when you look at flourishing that way, the idea that, that when you belong to Jesus and you say, I'm going to follow your culture, it's going to be from a place of wholeness, not a place of rules. Not a place of you have to do all these things and then I'll love you and then, and then you're a Christian. But a place of I'm whole. I belong to him. I do the right thing because he's working in my heart because my heart is healthy. It, it goes from the inside out. A friend of mine, um, Damaris Johnson, he, he used to play football in Buffalo. And uh, he, he spoke here like many years ago. And I remember what, what he spoke that day when, when he spoke. He said that, that physical health comes from your conditioning on up. If your body's conditioned well, you'll be able to you know, throw a pass in football and do all these great things in football. But the same happens with spiritual health. It comes from your spiritual conditioning on up. If, if you don't have a prayer life, then you're dead in the water. If, if, if you're not reading the word, then you're dead in the water. And those are parts of the, of the conditioning that happens. And in the Beatitudes, Jesus is saying to us, have you been trying to live by the law of Moses when he went to the mountain and said, you've got to do all these things and you'll be saved? Or do you want to live by belonging to me and then becoming part of my culture and it'll come spontaneously? Because whatever is born of God, says First John, overcomes the world. It comes naturally. You shouldn't have to strive at it or grind at it. Yes, there's work, but there's not striving work. The kind of work that exhausts you trying to be right all the time. Does that make sense this morning? That's what God wants from us this morning. He wants us to love him, not because he commands it, but because his seed and, and, and the word seed, literally, in, in, in the Greek, in John, means sperm. Did you know that? His sperm is in us. His spiritual sperm is inside us. And because he generates the work, that's why it happens. We grow because of what he planted inside us. Let's stand together. We're going to pray this morning. I want to thank you so much for being with us this morning. I want to ask the worship team to come, come up and just play, and we're going to pray. I want to pray into this this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'm reading through Deuteronomy right now as we pray. And it's interesting how God, he was giving the people the land, and he, and he said to them, as I give you this land, I have to give you a culture to live by. So he gave them all these rules. And there's a long reason why he had to give them rules because Christ wasn't there, but he was giving them a culture and saying, if you do these things, you'll flourish, you'll live. Now, we belong to him. If we're saved, we belong to him. And God is asking you today, have you been living by my culture? Or have you allowed the world with its opposite spirit to dominate your life with hatred with bitterness with hunger for power and lust and all these things that 
that the world says are important and the obsession with beauty and strength. Have you tried to be strong in your own strength only to fail? Have you tried to do it in your own cunning and wisdom and you realize it doesn't work because unless he does it, like Jeremiah once said, unless you turn me, I can't turn, Lord. Those who are watching today, those who are, who are online, do you know him? Do you have a relationship with him? I don't mean, are you a moral person? So many people are great moral people, but you don't, if you don't know Jesus, what's the point? You must belong to him to be saved. Whoever has the Son has life, the Bible says. Whoever has not the Son has not life. This is why he died. He died so that we can become whole in him. So that we can be delivered from our sins, the things that make us polluted in our hearts. And live as whole people so that we can be holy. So this morning, Father, we surrender our hearts to you. We come to you with nothing, nothing but our will to be surrendered. We come to you not in our strength, not in our own self-sufficiency, not in our own independence, but we come dependent on you. That unless you change us, unless you deal with, with those areas of our lives that won't change, Lord, we won't change. Only you can transform us. Only you can teach us what it means to be meek. Only you can teach us self-possession. Only you can show us what it means to be poor in spirit. Lord, forgive us for arrogance. Forgive us for trying to do things externally but not internally. Forgive us for trying to do the right thing without having a right heart. I pray for a heart of hunger in all of us and those who are watching. I pray that you awaken something new inside someone today. Someone who maybe has tried to be a good person in their own power. Someone who has tried to, to be ethical and do the right thing and, and, and they've done great things, but Lord, they don't know you. Only your righteousness can please the Father. Only your righteousness in us can please God. So we ask you, Lord, to impart your righteousness to someone today who does, does not know you and that you save them from themselves. Lord, give us the spiritual courage to live out your culture, what you expect of us in the new kingdom that you have started, Lord, in the world that is, is here in seed form and becoming greater and greater as you return. So we speak blessing over everyone today. We thank you for your greatness in all things. In Jesus' name we pray.